So if you've got one copy of this gene, you've got the lowest carb tolerance. If you've got 20, you can just plow through carbs, no problem. I was at two. So within one week of changing my diet to my carb tolerance, my genetic set point, all my digestive problems for as long as I've ever been alive went away. Dr. Shea, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got involved in functional medicine and especially genetics? Sure. So uh, my, my background's very common narrative for a lot of people who get involved in functional medicine. The, the common narrative is that they got sick with something or struggled with something, or they watched a dear family or friend go through it. And through that tremendous amount of pain, they tried all these different solutions and then found the solution or collective solutions known as functional medicine. So that's the short version. The slightly longer one is that I grew up, both my parents were medical doctors and they had a really nu bad nuclear divorce. Like to, me and my sisters were caught in that blast radius and I was six years old. And that was the, kind of the pivotal moment in my life where I developed severe, deep, uh, crushing insomnia for over 10 years, really bad digestive issues, anxiety, depression, two addictions, uh, one to video games, one to sugar. And in school, uh, at home, it was kind of an emotional war zone at school. On top of what was happening at home, it was kind of a physical war zone where I was uh, assaulted a lot. And there was no, the school never did what it should have, which was to intervene, stop, and uh, protect the, the smaller students amongst them. Uh, and I remember just, you know, I would, I had such bad insomnia that actually stunted my growth. Uh, the, you know, the biggest growth years are, you know, uh, for me, it was like a six to 18. And I remember lying to my school teachers saying that I felt sick because I'd feel so tired in the afternoon. Like I'd be falling asleep on my desk around two, 3 PM. I now know why from, you know, all the work and understanding circadian rhythms and adrenal rhythms and so on. But of course, back then, and I'm in second grade, I don't know any better. I just feel so tired. I can't keep my eyes open. So I would lie and say I felt sick just to go down to the nurse's office to take a nap. And basically, when I was a teenager, I, I made a decision that I have to get myself better or I'm going to do something rash. And uh, I found Dr. Jensen's Guide to Better Bowel Care. And he's considered the grandfather of Western naturopathy in, in at least in the States. And then through the help of a coach and later a mentor uh, named Eliza, she did what was called brain gym with me, which is a form of mind body kinesiology where it was, I, I learned from her that it is possible to change the body, to change the mind, change the mind, to change the body, that there was a two-way direction. That there, there was an empowerment there. It was, I wasn't just a, a victim of my own body. I, I remember waking up I mean, the, the contrast is, was quite stark. I remember waking up at 3 a.m. on the dot like, like I would for 10 years before I met her, like just waking up in this silent rage at my body, like hating it, hating my body. Like, what do you want from me? Why don't you, what do you want from me? What do you want? It was like, it was, I mean, it sounds a bit harsh, but it was like an abusive relationship. I'd be punished my body, my, my, my perceptions, my, my body would punish me for something, for a crime I didn't know I was committing. And I'd be punished and punished. And then randomly I'd feel good. It's like I was gaslit. And then suddenly my body would punish me again. And, and I just couldn't negotiate. I didn't know what to do except be punished and trapped in this relationship. And I learned. I, mean, I think a lot of people suffer with like self hatred with their body and yeah. health PTSD and, and things like that. So many struggle with that. Yeah, it's it's a very common and and there's a lot of it's 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 not even just self hatred and like this combative relationship with the body. There's also a tremendous amount of shame. A tremendous amount of shame. Like what's wrong with me? There's some. Everyone else seems to be doing fine. I mean, I just at some point I was you know, when I was growing up, I was like, clearly this is all my fault because everyone at school hates me. I get no support at home and people are yelling and lying. My body is attacking me. So clearly it's, it's, it's me because there's no feedback 
that it's not me, even for my own body. So that was formative, that experience. And then thankfully, I, I'm, I started reading really uh, good books on mind, body and natural medicine. And I met on Eliza and I learned that the, the body is a partnership. It's, it's not a combat, not a, not a combative relationship. And then I went into college and studied pre-med and then a holistic health practitioner degree in the evenings and weekends. And then just with the, with the sole goal of like trying to heal myself and also to become a doctor, but not a medical doctor anymore, but a, a, a natural doctor. And then went on dot, 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 went into chiropractic school and did two to three postgraduate seminars a month for every month that I was still in school, starting right from the first trimester. So I was just taking a well over a hundred postdoc seminars by the time I finished school on top of studying and, and, you know, going really deep into neurology, nutrition, lifestyle, and then uh, when I was in New Zealand, I uh, had a clinic out there for, I was in clinic for eight years. And I also did acupuncture, got an acupuncture degree, I was out there, got very heavy into functional medicine while I was in New Zealand, particularly focusing on adrenals, thyroid, mitochondria, gut, and then later on genetics. And so the, the tie into genetics was that genetics was the missing piece in the functional medicine space. So functional medicine for I, I, my favorite definition is it's the best of Western medical diagnostics with the best of natural medicine, lifestyle interventions. So functional medicine. So my definition of functional medicine is we use the best toys from Western science to get numbers, data, readouts, statistics, information. And then from that, we can then utilize all the wonderful uh, hundreds and thousands of years of wisdom in terms of how to correct the body from lifestyle, diet, nutrition, and then also use targeted supplements, which is all, again, this kind of estuary of Western science and natural, natural medicine to get someone better. And what was missing in my life was the genetics component. Despite having radically improved my life, my health, you know, changing my, my, my functional lab markers and everything else and, and improving my adrenal, all, all these things. I was still struggling with bad digestive problems and chronic joint pain. Now I had joint pain like an old man and it just didn't make any sense. And finally I learned about genetics and what I found, and I just took the seminar because it was recommended to me. And I always like learning about things and genetics is a thing. So I'm going to learn about a thing. So here we go. And I did the genetics testing on myself and I found that I was eating the wrong diet for my genetics, that I had a perfect Portlandia diet, you know, Mediterranean, like knew the names of the chickens, you know, the quinoa was grown in the South Island of New Zealand, picked by left-handed <laughs> monks on a full moon, sung in low tones and high tones, you know, you know, the bags were airlifted by butterflies, whatever. It's just the bag, you know, I have these perfect bags of quinoa, you know, soaked, sprouted, etc., and, I was still having really bad digestive problems, problems so bad would like empty a yoga room or I'd be in pain or, and it just, I, I didn't get it. I was eating so well, I was even teaching nutrition. So what it turned out was that my Mediterranean style diet wasn't appropriate for me from a carb tolerance standpoint. I have the carb tolerance of an Eskimo or an Inuit, not the carb tolerance of someone that lives on the latitude of middle to Southern Europe. So my ancestry came from Russia, like northern parts of Russia. So it makes sense that evolutionarily, there's not a lot of carbohydrates in like the winter is like an annual natural catastrophe. You know, it's, it's, I have the second lowest carb tolerance you can have. There's, there's people can have one to 20 copies of the specific gene that spits out amylase and it's a linear it's a linear thing. So if you've got one copy of this gene, you've got the lowest carb tolerance. If you've got 20, you can just plow through carbs, no problem. I was at two. So within one week of changing my diet to my carb tolerance, my genetic set point, all my digestive problems for as long as I've ever been alive went away. All you had to do was go carnivore. 
<laughs> well, uh, not not quite carnivore. Uh, it was it was paleo paleo bordering on keto. People who have one copy, they're pretty much keto. Twos straddle keto keto paleo. Threes and fours are really kind of paleo. Fives to eights are shades of gray of Mediterranean, and nine and above are shades a gray of higher carb or rather higher starch. So there are, there are high starch people out there. Um, and I had to, before I was, I, you know, I've really changed my position on diet because now we can genetically test. Now notice I didn't say vegan or vegetarian or meat. I said carbs. So you can have, there's, it's harder to be low carb if you're vegan, but the, the primary thing we're looking at is carb tolerance, whatever style of how you express that, you know, it takes a lot of personal and personal preferences and personal journeys and, and what people are comfortable with. The, so that, that was the diet piece. The second piece was the joint pain. And I found in, my, in the other genetics profile that I had, a, I had so many pro-inflammatory genes that all clustered together that were the highest priority genes for, because there's, there's hundreds, thousands of genes about inflammation, but there's only like 15 to 20 that are like the super generals, the ones at the very, very, very top that control everything underneath it. I had the majority of those be negative variants. So I was an avid over inflamer. So any little thing would trigger inflammation and it would sit in my joints. I wouldn't go to water retention, inflammatory water weight gain, like it does with a lot of other people, because I have a different set of genes that control how my fat and water is distributed. But instead, all the inflammation went to my joints. So when I learned that, I then she made the changes with that I learned from within the genetics profile, uh, more specifically, what's called nutrigenomic dosing. It's kind of getting into the weeds here, but nutrigenomic dosing is different from nutritional dosing. Nutrigenomic dosing is when people have genetic variants that they need much higher concentrations than what the RDA or what is normal dosing because they're genetic, they're genetically, they need more. So I have a way higher need for fish oil, like six grams a day than the one gram that most people are told to have. And my joint pain has gone away because I fall. No, I didn't learn that from a functional test. I learned that from a genetics. I learned about gen nutrigenomic testing from genetics, not from the functional. I love the functional, still do all the functional, but they, they talk about different things, the genetics versus functional. So those, those two things, I mean, there were other finds as well. Like uh, I found out I was genetically vulnerable to caffeine induced anxiety and depression. And so the people, caffeine induced anxiety and depression. There's a percentage of population, which I'm one, that caffeine actually triggers anxiety and depression. And it doesn't matter how bulletproof my coffee is. I can put as much coconut oil, coconut milk. I even put like licorice and uh, cardamom and cinnamon and burdock and clove and- uh, Anything turmeric. to make it work. <laughs> I was just trying to make it, I was trying to create this kind of holistic, self-righteous, mochaccino Moroccan chai that I could justify having my coffee and look, it's health food. It's, it's a, it's not coffee. It's an herbal delivery elixir, <laughs> you know, and I was, it was, I was BSing myself because I would still have that jittery and I was, and I was saying like, oh no, I'm just, I, I, I'm just getting energized from all the herbs. And I'm like, no, I was caffeine induced anxiety and depression. So I'm off of caffeine. Occasionally I have some, some, tea, you know, but a very, very dilute, very light, uh, but I don't have caffeinated coffee anymore. And, and there's a meaningful percentage of the population that has that. So I've had my diet radically changed from genetics in meaningful and effective ways. And also, you know, systemic issues that I've had going on that I didn't find out if not for the genetics. And it's not to the exclusion of all the other functional tests, like mitochondria, they, they find other things, but just, you asked me about genetics. It's like, those are the big, big things that I found in genetics uh, that for me personally, how I got into it. Yeah. And let's go back to that self-hatred for a minute, because there's mm -hmm. so many women out there that deal with self-hatred when it comes to their weight and their body image and trouble losing weight. So many women struggle with that because they, they're missing that 
that one last piece, which is the genetic piece. And because, you know, and they don't know what their genetics are. They haven't tested them. And so you found out that women have three different types, uh, three different genetic types when it comes to weight loss. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So, so let's, let me just linger a bit on the emotional. I mean, yeah, we're talking about genetics, but we we can't separate emotion from genetics because how you feel changes your epigenetic expression. And additionally with genetic knowledge is power. And one of the frustrating things about dealing with one's health issues, whether it's weight that you can't get rid of that. I mean, aside from cosmetic, you know, points, one's getting current society standards, there's the health realities of carrying excessive weights, excessive weight. And by learning the genetics, by learning about one's genetics, it's like now all these keys can be unlocked that instead of hating it, it's, 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 it was like with me, with my joint pain, I just couldn't understand why I, I was in so much joint pain and, and nothing I'm doing was working. But then when I got the knowledge, suddenly it all opened up. So what I described my joint pain directly relates to the first of the three uh, weight gains. The first one's inflammatory water weight gain. The second one's hormonal toxic weight gain. The third one is caloric fat weight gain. That's the one that most people think of calories in put weight on. That's actually the least common pattern I see in people with, with, who are struggling with weight, who want to get their genetics done. Most common is the inflammatory water weight. So the inflammatory water weight is the following. People have these the inflammatory genes, about 15 to 20 are the major, major, major ones. And some people are way pro-inflammatory compared to others. So people can either initiate inflammation more rapidly, propagate or, or perpetuate it longer, or they have trouble extinguishing it. I happen to have all three, lucky me. So why does that create weight for some people? Well, I'll use the muffin test as the analogy. So the muffin test is that some people listening, and this, and this, is, this is what I actually lectured at the genetics conferences about in New Zealand when I went into this really deep and was invited to speak on this. You take a muffin and you, some people listening to this, you, you know, many of you will have the experience if you eat a muffin or half a muffin, and then you put on one, two, three, four pounds in one day, it just in that day, you just suddenly balloon up one to four pounds. Now, unless that muffin, that muffin didn't weigh two, three pounds, unless it, unless it was last year's regifted Christmas fruitcake. Is the only circumstance a muffin is going to weigh two, three pounds. So <clears throat> what happened? That muffin triggered this massive wave of inflammation in the body for whether it's the ingredients, the gluten, the, the conditioners, the sugars, the chemicals, whatever it is. And the body has an inflammatory response to toxic chemicals. And if you have a genetic over exuberant response, you create a lot of inflammation. And so what does inflammation do? It's retaining water in the body, retaining water in the, it's called the interstitial fluids, retaining water in order to do what? Dilute the toxic inflammatory chemicals from damaging cells and tissues and to buy the liver and kidneys time to filter out the toxic inflammatory chemicals. That's why you can swell up. And then over time, it gradually recedes because you swell up to dilute the toxic inflammatory chemicals triggered by the muffin, the, the proverbial muffin. And then in time, your liver and kidneys struggle slowly, slowly, but eventually remove the inflammatory chemicals. That's this inflammatory water weight. Now, it doesn't have to just be from that muffin. It can be from over-exercise. And that's, that's a real mind trip. You want to talk about demoralizing. You have this group of people, men and women, I've worked with both, that the more they exercise, the fatter they get. I mean, that is demoralizing. And I think I found the reason why is because when I run their genetics, at least on the people I've worked with and run their genetics on, they all have the same pattern. They are massively pro-inflammatory. And then when they over-exercise, it triggers inflammation. there's There's this point, this kind of invisible line that's crossed where exercise transitions from anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory. And then suddenly they start putting on water weight from over-exercising. So that's the first one. 
The second one, it can be paired with this, with the first one, the second one's called hormonal toxic weight. And this is where you have trouble detoxing the, the, there's, there's genes for detox in the liver. There's, there's eight major ones and four of them are directly tied, uh, four, possibly five are directly tied to estrogen detox. So when people have these genetic problems, uh, variants, they're not able to detox estrogen fast enough, then they develop estrogen dominance. And so it's a combination. It's not, it's, it's not just like you have the genes and suddenly you're estrogen dominant. It doesn't work like that. You have to have the environmental triggers. So I look for, do you have exogenous or external sources of estrogen affecting you? Whether it's, I mean, your, your audience has probably heard of this list before. It's like microwave plastic, bad makeup, certain insecticides, pesticides, growth horm uh, hormones injected into certain meats in certain countries, uh, soy products, um, makeups, body lotions, etc. Like there's things out there, plastic, uh, I said plastic, uh, petrochemicals, certain, all sorts of stuff can mimic estrogens. So you have the external exposure, but then the inability to get rid of it. That's what creates the estrogen dominance. So what happens is that especially when they're combined, the inflammatory weight gain and the hormonal toxic genetic weight. So for a man, these are the two case, case studies I presented at one of the conferences. Both of these men were large, were overweight, had chronic joint pain. The more they exercised, the more pain they were, the more they put on weight. And they both had man boobs. Now, I presented at the genetics conference on this phenomenon, not because I have some weird fixation on man boobs. I'm just observant. And I was like, huh. So the more they exercise, the fatter they get and the more in pain they are. That sounds like hyper-inflammatory, but they also have man boobs. I wonder if they also have the hormonal toxic weight pattern that they're not able to get rid of the estrogen. And I wonder if it's related, the inflammation and the estrogen, like, is it related? So I ran their genetics and sure enough, their caloric burning genes were like near perfect. Like they had no problems burning calories. It was the, their inflammatory genes and their hormonal detox genes were a mess. So for the, they were told by all their other clinicians and their friends and family and, and, and shamed by their other, by, by their GPs or whatever. So you need to exercise more and eat less. That's why you're so fat. And that was the exact wrong thing for them to do. So instead I identified one guy had like six out of the seven, eight, sources of external estrogen, like I pulled them off all of those, put them on anti-inflammatory liver supporting anti-estrogen diets, lifestyle supplements, etc. Got them slowed down their exercise to not exercising every day, but to walking every day and high intensity interval training limited twice a week. One gentleman lost 40 pounds in one month. Okay. Now he had a lot to lose. So if people listening, like, Oh my God, I'm going to lose 40. No, no, no. He had a lot to lose and he was set up perfectly. He actually did what I instructed. He was ready. He had the right mindset. He would like all these factors came together. Another guy, the other gentleman lost uh, two pounds a week for so 14 or 16 weeks. I can't remember, but just consistently. And, and the weight came off their chest. It came off their belly. And what happened physiologically is that they were over inflaming for, and the genes are over inflaming. And then the liver had to make a choice. Do I deal with the toxic acute inflammation chemicals now that are really, really dangerous? Or do I have to deal with the estrogens that are kind of there in the background and are building up, but are less of an immediate problem? And, and I ask this question when I'm lecturing to bigger audiences and I ask this, no, 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 people, no medical training. People with medical training do not answer this question. I'm just going to ask the lay public, what do you think you would do if you were the liver? What would you choose to do? Estrogen or inflammation? And every single person says inflammation and they're right. So what happened is that the liver had to triage and prioritize the inflammation and then the estrogen built up. And so as man boobs were developed in the men. Now in women, when they have this exact same genetic pattern, it's not that they develop more breast tissue necessarily, it's that their cycles go off. So I had another client that same thing was over exercise, found some new trainer without telling me that was one of this like super over enthusiastic CrossFit ilk. 
that just overtrained her every day. And she called me up in a panic. This is like, I'm losing muscle. I'm putting on weight and my cycles have been are, are thrown off and they've never been off my whole life. She had the exact same pattern, high pro-inflammatory genes, estrogen detox genes were, were not good. And so the same process, over-inflamed, liver had to make a choice. And the, the hormones got all wonky because her liver couldn't handle them because it was dealing with the inflammation. Same situation with her, rebalanced her lifestyle, diet, nutrition, supplements, muscle tone came back, water weight went away, hormones rebalanced. And I had some very strong words for her trainer about cutting it down. So those are the two primary patterns that I see in the genetics. The third one is the caloric fat weight. That's the one everyone classically associates with it. Calories in, weight goes on. Can we talk about sure. the liver in regards to the issues with, uh, you know, balancing your hormones or excess mm -hmm. estrogen? Because the, the liver's one of the main routes for, you know, recycling excess estrogen. And yep. so many people have liver issues. A hundred million people have fatty liver disease. What role does that play in your genetics? So in the genetics that I run, there's one panel that checks for approximately 64 genes, the, the, the highest that are organized into the seven drivers of all diseases. So we're not looking, we're not looking for the heart disease gene, the cancer gene, the diabetes gene, the Alzheimer's gene, or the, the weight gain gene necessarily, or the stroke gene. What we're looking at are what are the drivers that are above all the quote, quote unquote disease genes. So those drivers are inflammation, the ability to quench free radicals in the mitochondria, your ability to detox in the liver, your ability to absorb vitamin D, something called methylation, which is a really big topic. And the next one is the cardiovascular circulation. And the last one is fat and energy metabolism. So those are the seven drivers and they're actually rank ordered. So inflammation controls the other ones underneath. And then the free radical scavenging controls the ones underneath and the liver detox controls the ones underneath those. So when I look at liver and genetics, I look at the eight major liver genes, three for phase one detox, five for phase two. And then I look at the genes above it. I look at the 15 inflammatory genes, the three major free radical scavenging genes in the mitochondria, um, et cetera. And the way, that, the way that I organize the information is what are, do I see clusters? So I'm not, if someone has out of the, eight liver genes, I've got six that have negative variants that are quote unquote yet red and yellow dots. I don't look for six separate lifestyle recommendations. I look for what are, what has been shown in peer reviewed research done on humans, not wombats or nematodes, but what peer reviewed research has been done on humans to show that lifestyle diet nutrition alone has changed the expression of these rogue genes. So I look for not six separate interventions. I look for the one, two, or three things that affect all six of them that are really, that are easy to implement. If they've got out of 15 of the inflammatory genes, they've got 10 that have negative variants. I don't look for 10 separate lifestyle interventions. I look for what's the fewest number of interventions that affect all 10. And ideally those same ones that would also affect the liver genes in the same way. So my job is to find what's the fewest number of lifestyle interventions that will affect the most number of the highest priority genes, including liver. So when I look at liver, I'm looking at not just liver, but everything above it that controls it. And there's differences in what you do, like if they've got more of a phase two issue versus a phase one. For people listening, phase one and phase two, it's uh, I, the way uh, Dr. Kalis described it as it's like a washer dryer system. So phase one is where it's like the washer, you have dirty clothes, you bring it to the washer, and then you put it in the dryer phase two to dry it out. And if it goes from dirty washer or dryer, you have clean clothes and you're ready to go. It's all good. If, however, you have a, wa a, a dryer that's broken or slow or backed up or overwhelmed and you wash the clothes but never dry them, the clothes can mold and become even worse than if you have never washed them in the first place. So that's the same thing that happens in phase one. Phase one is you take a toxic chemical like benzene and you put it in phase one, now it becomes a benzene oxide radical, which is a hundred times more dangerous than benzene was. But if you have your phase two ready, you chuck it in the dryer and you quickly glom on a sulfur group or whatever to neuter it. So then it can be put into the gallbladder and put into your intestines and pooped out. 
So, but if your phase two genes are not work, if they're not fast enough, you get this backup in phase one, and suddenly you have all these extra strong free radical versions of the toxins causing lots and lots of problems. So when I look at, when I look at genetics, the, the primary focus, the, the thing I look for first is, do I need to support phase two? And do I need to calm down phase one? And so let's go into the phase three, like the number three cause of women's genetic weight issues. Sure, the caloric fat. So, so there's 16 genes uh, in this report that look at your how well you ab- absorb, retain, uh, and burn calories, as well as your ability of four genes for satiation or satiety. Like, uh, do you feel full? So I've got variants on, I think three, I think it's three out of four of those satiation genes. So I've always overeaten like, and I mean, I have the metabolism of a bumblebee, so I don't put on weight, but all the toxic, all the, all the toxic inflammatory chemicals and foods I grew up with, it didn't go into fat cells for me because the other set of genes that I have for burning fat for energy are very strong. Instead, all the toxins went into my nervous system and my joints and my brain, leading to the depression, the anxiety, and the joint pain and the insomnia. So the yeah, third- there, there's a protective factor in when people who gain weight from the like, food that they eat, yeah. there are toxins going on their fat, but people Correct. who don't like you, it goes into other yes. areas that are problematic. Thank you for saying that. When I've lectured in, 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 in to public audiences, I've gotten one or two snarky remarks. Well, lucky you, you don't burn, put on fat. It's like, and I paused and said, now, hold on. It's all about trade-offs. So yeah, supposedly lucky me, I'm very, you know, svelte in a muscular body, but the problem is, is I have no buffer. I have no buffer at all to toxic chemicals, inflammation, or other stuff that, that the body throws into the fat cells, which are the dirty, dirty closets of the body. It's the dirty closet of the body. Just shove it all in there. And when we have time and the resources and the focus, we can then detox. But until then it just goes there. Okay. So that's, that's a safety buffer that people have. I don't have that. So where does it go? Into my nerves, into my brain, into my organs and into my joints. And so I feel it immediately. If people study Ayurveda, uh, the Pitta constitution, the fiery constitution of which I'm definitely one, we're mesomorphs. We're like, they talk about Pitta people are, I mean, they, these ancient systems of healing didn't have the Western scientific tools, but they had these wonderful metaphors and thousands of years of observation. But people with the Pitta constitution like me, they, they can't burn dirty food. Like they, the, 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 that's the metaphor, like burning dirty, dirty fuel. Like we get affected psychologically way faster and physically way faster from dirty food, food and dirty pollution than people who can layer on fat, like the, the, Kapha body types, the the fatter body types, you know, jolly old Santa, like because they're not the toxic chemicals aren't going up to their brain as readily as they are for people like me. Mm-hmm. So when we look at the calorie fat weight genes that people have, I look for do they have the genes to control satiety, satiation? And so then if and if those are off, then we engage uh lifestyle changes to help them, you know, as someone who was a former food addict, I'm I have a lot of expertise in that hard way of how to help people with their satiation. Then I look at the genes that burn fat for energy and the genes that burn fat for heat. So uh, I, I remember sitting in school and the person sitting next to me actually commented, like, can you turn it down? I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, you are a radiator. I can feel. And it's, and I'm like, what exactly do you want me to do about that? Like wear an ice pack or like, but, but I, I run hot literally because the uncoupling genes are, 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 you know, strong green dots that I just burn fat for heat quite readily. And people who don't, these are people who can tend to feel cold a lot, even if they have carrying a lot of weight, uh, they still can feel cold. That may be a thyroid issue as well. And some other things, but if people aren't burning fat for heat, they, this can be one reason why they feel cold. Uh, and if they're not able to burn fat for energy, it may be one reason why they can feel tired is because they're not more easily, readily able to burn an entire fuel source of fat. Some people may be thinking is like, well, this is kind of unfair. Why is it that certain people have these genetic variants that help them do this versus help them do that? Well, 
if I come from a, you know, Northern Russia ancestry, it's pretty good for me to be able to burn fat for heat, you know, so I stay warm in a super cold environment. Uh, then there's the pro-inflammatory genes. Like why is some people have these really terrible genetic variations where they're so pro-inflammatory? And the answer based on anthropology is really straightforward. What is the point of inflammation? The point of inflammation is to heal damaged tissue and kill infections. Why is that relevant in anthropology? Well, if I'm a hunter gatherer and I go with my band of hunters to go try to take down a very large animal with a tiny stick, one or more of us is going to be bitten, mauled, trampled, or gored. And if I have a really strong inflammation response, what is a bite wound from an animal? It's an injection of pathogens from their teeth and saliva, and it's a tearing of flesh. So what does inflammation do? It rushes in, tries to kill the infection and heal the damage. So if I have a stronger inflammatory response, that means that I am more likely to survive a hunting expedition than my non-pro-inflammatory uh, hunting party members. So it's all trade-offs, even the inflammation, it's all trade-offs. And so we're just having to live in a current society, you know, us moderns, where there's not a lot of physical relative to how we used to live. There's just not a lot of physical trauma that would have necessitated having high inflammatory genes as a genetic advantage. Yeah. And so you articulated that so well, because I think uh, people tend to, they, they go with the calories in, calories out kind of mantra that that's how you lose weight and people punish themselves and hate themselves and they get on the scale every morning. And so you articulated that so, so well, better than I think anyone I've had on the show thus far. Um, and it really helps to illustrate the different, uh, the different ways that people are challenged with weight loss. So, I mean, beyond what we've discussed, uh, how are your methods different when you come to uh, doing genetics tests or interpreting genetics tests? Very. Um, so one is everyone's got like, they, they've run into what I call 23 immune syndrome, where they just run their 23 me, punch it through an algorithm, and then they get overwhelmed and confused and frankly, a little scared of like the 300 health tips. And there's no organization, there's no prioritization. There's no one there to help walk you through what all the changes you need to do. So uh, for one, I use a different lab. I use, uh, I use a different lab that has a higher accuracy because I mean, if you read the fine print of 23andMe last I checked is they'd only guarantee 95% accuracy, oh, which wow. that's, one in, that's one in 20 genes. So really pretty, think about that. That's pretty bad for a genetic that, That's pretty bad. The lab that I use is, is well over 99% and, and, percent, and I've been to the lab in Australia and they showed, I can't talk about how to do it because I made an agreement not to say anything, but it was pretty cool. They could even tell you, they even showed me how they were able to figure out there were two, two different people's DNA on the swab. Because what happened is the mom had, they found out after they'd figured this out because the, gene, the way it was like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, this, this is two sets of genes on here. What happens, the mom did the cheek swab, let it air dry and her little, she went to go do something. Her toddler came by, thought it was a lollipop, put it in his mouth. And then, oh, there's not much sugar on that cheek swab. And then put it back down to air dry. And she didn't realize what had happened and sent it off. So super accurate. That's number one. Number number two is that the carb test isn't available through 23andMe because it's not checking. The carb test isn't checking for variants. It's not checking if it's a, you know, a red, green, or yellow dot. It's checking for the duplicates of a gene. So it's a completely separate swab, completely different mechanism. There's a three dimensionality to genes that not many people know about, which is the number of duplicates of a gene. Not merely is it a variant of one or one or the other. So he's a different lab. One of the tests for the carb tolerance is a totally separate genetic things that 23andMe and Ancestry doesn't even do. The other thing is how I organize the data. So I'm only looking at about 100 genes, uh, maybe less. And these are the high priority genes that look at the drivers of diseases. So I'm not chasing after hundreds and hundreds. I'm looking at the highest priority ones. And then I look at clusters is there, is, is that's not looking, I'm not looking for like interleukin six in the inflammatory gene, even though it's there, it's in that 15 major 15. I'm not just looking at that. That's, that's a mistake to fix it. It's like a, it's like germ theory. It's like one germ, one, one disease, one gene, one disease. That's not like we're, we're, we're there's, there's a whole thing that goes into this. 
there's combinations of, of genes, constellations of genes, clusters. And so I'm looking at, is there a pattern in inflammation as such? Not one specific gene I'm looking for. And if there's a pattern of overinflammation, then I can focus there on the lifestyle changes according to that pattern. Just like if there's a pattern of liver detox problems, a pattern of, of problems of quenching free radicals in the mitochondria, a pattern of problems dealing with the caloric fat genes. Is there a problem with cardiovascular? The eight, the eight major genes for cardiovascular health. If someone's got one or two genes that are variants in the cardiovascular system, I'm really not going to be paying that much attention to the cardiovascular genes as a problem. If they've got six or seven, now we're now we have a problem that we're, I'm not going to focus there. And then I organize out of all these genes that have the variants, where are the clusters, where are the priorities, and then figure out what's the fewest number of lifestyle interventions that will help the most number of these genes. So people don't get a list of 60 things, 100 things. They get a list of here's the top 10 and, and, and rank order. And I can explain exactly why they're ranked in order because I have a paper that shows this lifestyle change affects this gene in this beneficial way. And if this one intervention affects 12 genes, and so that one intervention helps 12 genes, and then I have another intervention that only helps three genes, that 12, that 12 gene thing is going to go on top. So I can rank order it based on the number of citations to the genes in question. The other thing that I do is I look at, there's another specialized panel in this called the vitamin D. It's a vitamin D panel, which is very important in these days, as you know, the importance of vitamin D. So there's eight major genes between the sunlight and your blood in terms of making vitamin D and putting in those, there's eight major genes. And that journey, those eight genes can either be, it's either a freeway or it's dirt roads and, and back alleys. And uh, if people, people can have the mistaken idea that, oh, I'll just get some sunlight, like not necessarily true. Not necessarily true. If you've got, first off, it depends on where you are in the world. Do you, do you get UVB? Like in New Zealand, you only get UVB in the summertime three months, only between about 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. during the day. That's it. Not, not during the other months of the year and the other times, even in the summer, in the summer months. So people have to have those good genes in order to trans, you know, create vitamin D from sunlight, assuming they got the other cofactors and, and everything nutritionally to make it happen. But getting it into the blood is only half the story. Then there's getting it from the blood into the cells. And these are the vitamin VDR genes or vitamin D receptor genes. And so if someone is struggling, you know, vitamin, just, just to kind of illustrate how important it is, vitamin D is estimated to control up to about 5% of the entire genome. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. And vitamin D primarily is known medically for helping with the immune system and with inflammation, not just bone, not just bone stuff. So, I mean, it's no wonder vitamin D is such an important issue in these days, you know, inflammation and infections. And, but getting, if you can't, if you don't have the genes to reliably make sunlight into vitamin D, then you need to know that. And then you need to know if you've got problems with getting vitamin D into the cells, what lifestyle changes you can make to get the vitamin D from the blood into the cells so they actually can do their work. Uh, the other genes I look at are food, uh, food intolerances. So uh, as one genetically at risk for gluten, for celiac, lactose, uh, I already mentioned the coffee induced anxiety and depression genes. Do, are they genetically vulnerable to histamines? Are they genetically vulnerable to salt in terms of high blood pressure? And th there's many factors that go into blood pressure. Salt is just one. So this is just looking at that one factor out of many that goes into blood pressure. And then the last one is alcohol. What is their relation to alcohol through their genetics? Are they more likely to develop uh, addiction to alcohol? Or are they prone to like have have very rapid onset problems when they drink alcohol, like getting flushes or feeling super unwell? And the people that are green dots in their ability to consume alcohol, they have a much higher risk 
for developing alcoholism because they don't feel the negative, immediate negative effects of people who develop these flushes and other problems. And then of course, there's the carb tolerance portion, which is, I think, one of the most important parts. If you can, if you can genetically figure out this aspect of your diet from here on out, like, are you in the keto realm, the paleo realm, the Mediterranean realm, shades of gray of that, and the, or the high starch realm, that has effects for the entire rest of your life for every meal you eat from here on out. Mm -hmm. So that's, and I customize, look, there's the official reports with all the jargon and kind of the alphabet soup of all the gene names and, you know, and it's just all, and, but what I do is I take all the official reports and customize them down into someone's personable, actionable, prioritized report. So they have like their personal genetics Rosetta stone that they can now just use and know, okay, I need to do this, 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 and this. And, and I love that because that's a problem I think with a lot of genetics tests, there isn't a really viable, well-interpreted action plan. Cause I don't think it can really be done by a computer, uh, you know, cause they're so, it's so complicated. Um, how all the genes interact with each other. And I think it takes a human for the most part to interpret the genetics and create this action plan. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you. It's, it's, um, I've had many people come to me with 23andMe syndrome and just be overwhelmed, confused, and also scared because they, they see the, because people don't know like what genes are the highest priority, but they think, oh my God, this gene's at risk for this, 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 and this. And they don't realize that that's true if your inflammation genes are not behaving well. That gene you're worried about is actually way downstream. And, and going back to the original discussion around like the emotions and, and like the self-hatred and the shame and but even just understanding that, okay, I'm an over-inflamer genetically. That makes total sense from a hunter-gatherer point of view. So I no longer hate my genes, hate my parents for that or hate what, or whatever. Like I, I'm not in this kind of, oh my God, I am flawed, deeply flawed in some un, uh, uh, irretractable way on, my, on the gene level. It's like, no, I'm just, I have the genes that are adapted for a specific situation. You know, same thing with, with hormonal and estrogen detox. Like my theory is that why would you want to limit estrogen detox genetically? Well, in period, Periods of feast and famine, particularly the famine bit, hormone production can get shut down if you're not, if calories are at a deficit, as was frequently the case in a hunter gatherer situation. Yeah. That's so why a lot of women go, they go keto or they, super low carb and their hormones just get totally shot. And they're like, what's going on? It's exactly. that whole system. So maybe it might have been a genetic advantage to just have a certain section of the population to retain more estrogen than other people, despite the exact same climate environment and food availability, because you never knew if in order to, to propagate the genes into the next generation, you just needed that extra insurance of having extra estrogen floating around. Same thing with the calorie fat retention. So if I have genes to put on fat, that makes a lot of sense in environments where you're at risk for ongoing periods of famine, that you can carry weight around your belly, which is the center of your mass, leaving your hips and shoulders free to walk very long distances to forage in other areas or to sprint short distances, either away from something or after something. Sumos, they're very fast at very short distances. They're extremely fast. So you can still put weight on even a lot of weight around the belly and be able to walk long distances to forage for other food or to hunt or to get away from, from a tiger or something. So even, even the weight gain genes make sense evolutionarily as part of let's have insurance by having some people with these genes and some people with that genes and some people with this and da, 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 da. And it's all, it's all just about trade-offs. It's always about trade-offs and, and ensuring there's enough variability in the population to ensure the next generation will survive. So if someone listening and they're you know, kind of curious about their genes now and what their genetic type is, how does somebody work with you to figure all that out? Sure. They just go to my website, uh, drsamshay.com, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y. That's shay.com. And there they can uh, schedule a chat with me at, at this the time of this recording. I'm happy to chat with people 15 minutes, no charge for a health strategy call. I also have a free ebook 
uh, on my website. It's a gen- it's an ebook I wrote on genetics, and it's it's really short. It's it's just a really nice looking PowerPoint slide. It's saved as a PDF that it walks through this entire thing. Uh, much more detail and some some graphics. Um, even has a little picture of a muffin half eaten on one of them. <laughs> slide number three, I think, two, three, or four, whatever, something like that. Um, and uh, they they can if they if people want to get really granular and like kind of review this and see more detail on the genetics. That's what the ebook is for. Or if they're feeling like they they really want to just get started, they can talk to me and see uh, about what the different options are for people for doing their genetics. Uh, normally people just do just fresh swabs to go to the, to the other lab that I use in Australia. And then when I get the results back, I take, it takes about a month to turn around. It's a little bit longer because there's problems currently at the time of this recording with USPS sending out um, stuff to Australia because of, you know, various issues with what's going on in the world. But in general, it's like a month or so I get the results back and then I put a whole plan together and we do a report of findings and you, we go over your Rosetta Stone, your specific genetics and exactly what to do, diet, lifestyle, supplements, exercise, food intolerances, what goes on vitamin D, you know, just, just walk through it all. And you've got, a, you've got your own personalized, customized report for life because genes don't change. Over, I mean, let's say I'm silly enough to inject CRISPR, but your genes don't change. So whatever people invest in now in their genes and their health, like just amortize that over the next however many decades you plan on living. And it's, it is a pittance, you know, it is nothing to invest right now in proper genetics analysis for the gains you get over the, amortized over the next several decades. Yeah. I mean, that sounds just completely life-changing, especially for anyone that's struggling with their weight or has just feel like they're a hamster on a wheel and they're just waking up. I, I, saw, I know so many women that are waking up at 4 30, 5 a.m. In, in the morning, going to do punishing, like high punishing. cardio, high punishing. cardio aerobics, and they're foregoing sleep and thinking that they're, you know, going to make some miracle happen with their body. So if that sounds like you, I, I urge you to work with Dr. Sam Shea and figure out what your genetic plan is. So, you, you know, you kind of, at some point you have to just let every, you know, allow instead of trying to force uh, your body into submission and trying to push this rock up a hill, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's much smarter to have a, a plan based on your genetics. I want to add one asterisk to genetics testing. Uh, and I just want to give people a reality check on genetics. Genetics testing, I mean, just, well, it changed my life. It's changed the life of people I've worked with. But I want to give an asterisk just to give people a reality check. If you do genetics testing and you implement all these different things and you're not getting the changes that you're looking for, that's when you look at functional testing. Is there a hidden gut infection? Do you have a massive immune, is your immune system just going haywire on something else that's going on in your body? Is your thyroid off? Is your adrenals off? Is your mitochondria itself? Are you missing key amino acids, key fatty acids? Do you have heavy metal toxicity? Do you have these other things that the genes don't tell you what your vitamin D level is now? They don't tell you what your mito, you know, your adrenal functions now. They're different windows so genetics test is not exclusively the one and only magic bullet. That is not that. It is not that. It is a major component of a whole health picture. And if people are doing genetics and they've gotten a proper analysis, and after a couple of months, you're not seeing the changes that you're wanting to, you have to look at the, through these other lenses. So I'm not saying genetics is the one and only thing. I'm saying it's a major piece that people have been missing. And even if this piece doesn't work to the levels you're wanting, then we have another window to look at as well. And then once the functional piece is cleaned up, then the gene, the changes recommended from the genes are unobstructed. And then you can gain the benefits from the genetics recommendations going forward. Thanks for clarifying that because yeah, genetics are static and they don't represent active 
things going on, like your vitamin status and active infections and things right. like that. So very, very good to clarify that. Uh, well, Dr. Shea, thank you so much for coming on the show. And everyone, thanks so much for tuning in every week to the Myers Detox podcast, where I try to bring you, you know, really important information and tools to help you live the, the your best life and for help you gain the health that you deserve and the joy that you deserve also. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com, and I'll talk to you guys next week. The Myers Detox Podcast is created and hosted by Wendy Myers. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Wendy Myers and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.